everybody, and I'm very pleased to introduce Dr. Shannon Dowler, uh, who is a GP in our terms, but Shannon actually is an American doctor, so she would be called MD, obviously. Um, and we're going to talk today about um, sex in an ageing population, which actually sounds pretty, that sounds quite dire, doesn't it? But I think it's, um, it started off because we were promoting Shannon's book, I don't know if you can see that, Never Too Late. Oh, it's all going a bit fuzzy. Um, which I have just read, and I have to say, Shannon, it is a brilliant, fun read. Easy yeah. to understand, so really good. So before we plough on to sex for an older person, um, Shannon, I'm not just not getting that one right, am I? Shannon, please introduce yourself. I am Shannon Dowler. I'm a family physician, which is your version of a GP. Um, and I've been in practice a little over 20 years. I live in the mountains of North Carolina, um, and I have a special interest and expertise in sexual health. And I have since the beginning of being a physician when I started my training back in the late 90s. It's, it's always been a part of the work that I've done. Um, even though it's not necessarily my full career focus, it is, it's been an area of interest and passion the whole time through. And so... What made you write the book and why particularly on this subject? So I've done lots of talking to physicians and to lay audiences over the last 20 years about sexual health and really focusing on sexually transmitted infections and how can you be, you know, sexually healthy um, and not end up with some of the infections that aren't a lot of fun for people. But that's usually was focused in the younger demographic. We think about our our adolescents and young adults make up a quarter of the sexually active population, but they get over half of the sexually transmitted infections. So they they win. You know, they're getting most of them. Yeah. But in the clinic, what I've been seeing over the last five, six years um, was this increasing age of the population that I was seeing in the STD clinic. And so I'm in a health department where we have just focused, we just see people for sexual health. And it went from being the average age of maybe 20 um, to maybe 30 and 40. And then one day in clinic, everybody I saw was over the age of 50. And I, what is going on? So at that time, it's, you know, and it was kind of at the time, the villages in the, in the United States, which is a retirement community. I don't know if it made the news in England, but there are all these headlines about infections in the villages, which were probably a lot of hype and not actually totally real. But I made a rap video um, called STDs Never Get Old. And, and we're it, putting that as a link, because I think everybody should watch it. It's very amusing, very amusing. It was sort of a fun um, it, a fun take on something, a pattern I was seeing in clinic. And it went viral. And it was interesting. It, it was at a time when in the United States, things were very politically charged and very partisan. Um, but it was linked to by conservatives, uh, websites, and liberal websites. So everybody was interested in this idea of older adults being sexually active and getting sexually transmitted infections because people hadn't thought of it. And so I pitched the idea to a publisher and say, why didn't I write this book? I think this is something really happening here. We're seeing the numbers go up. We're seeing the patterns and trends. Um, I think there's a real need for sex ed. A lot of our older adults haven't had sex ed in 50 years. Uh, it is a totally different world out there now. Yeah. And I think also, and I'm sure it's the same in the States, you know, with the, um, you know, Younger people are very much encouraged to go and be tested, especially when they're having a new partner or just on a monthly basis. The older generation, we weren't brought up to do that. You only went to a sex clinic, which was very much a, you know, behind closed doors, wasn't something you would admit to. You certainly wouldn't go there unless you'd got a real problem. I and mean, then attitudes have changed so much, haven't they? About And I think the younger population are far better educated than we we were yeah absolutely and the stigma attached to sexually transmitted infections is very different for yeah. the 60 plus crowd than it is for the 20-ish year old crowd today although I will say no one's really excited to be diagnosed with a sexually transmitted infection but um it, and it's really surprising to older adults when I diagnose them with something they're oh. like but but the fella looked clean and, and it's just not about that. There are so many things yeah. that people don't have symptoms of. They don't know they're infected. It's just a very different world than it was, you know, 20, 30, 40 years ago. 
a lot of people are now widowed or they've decided later in life to maybe their marriage hasn't been happy. And, and so they're on the dating scene for the first time in decades. And they just don't have, they don't have that background to understand how the world has changed, how sexual networks have changed, how their risks have changed and, and what you need to do to take care of yourself. And honestly, in healthcare, I expect it's the same for you all as it is in the United States. There's this sort of bias at the doctor's office that once people hit a certain age, they become asexual. And wow. the fact of the matter is that is not what happens. There are lots and lots of people who are enjoying late life sex um, more than ever before. And so it's on us as doctors to open up the conversation, to offer the screenings, to ask people, are you sexually active? Is it working well for you? Or do you need any treatments or options? And let's make sure we do your screening test, to make sure you don't have any infections. And I think also, I mean, this thing, age is always a difficult thing. And age has changed. You know, if you look at any surveys, and I think probably at Talk Health, we could be easily guilty of it. We say 65 plus, and that's it. Now, you didn't, you won't ever see six, 20 plus in a survey. It's 20 plus, thir it's 20, 30, 40, 50. What happens between the 60 to 90? Because, you know, that's a 30 year period that lots of people are now living. It, it suddenly that's, they're all junked together. Yeah. So half of people in their 60s remain sexually active. 10% um, of people in their 90s remain sexually active. And so that's, that's a significant difference as far as looking at the risk, but that 10% in their 90s, they still need to be getting tested for things and make good choices when they're sexually active. As yeah. is that 50% of the people in their 60s, but you're right, we, we bunch it together, we sort of assume people aren't going to be sexually active, but let's be honest, it's the, the folks that are now going into the retirement age are, are the people that re led the sexual revolution in the 60s. You know, they're the ones that really challenged the norms and how we thought about sex, how we thought about masturbation, how we thought about monogamy. And so why is anybody surprised that they're retiring and continuing to teach us how one can evolve sexually? It's This is the generation that taught us in the 60s. So of course they continue to teach us. Absolutely. So... I mean, I suppose the thing too is how do you identify, you know, if there's something wrong? Do you, you know, what, how do people present? That's, you know, it's a great question. The probably half of infections, and this is so hard, don't have any symptoms at all. And so you might have an infection that you're sharing with other people and have no idea. Um, so that's why screening tests are so important. And depending on your risk, and I lay this out in the book sort of based on kind of people you're having sex with and how many times you change partners, like what your risk is and how often you should get tested. So for the people that are super duper high risk, which every three months they might need to be tested to someone who's in a long-term mutually monogamous relationship where you stop screening at some point because it's not necessary. There's this, this whole continuum. A lot of people have no symptoms, but some people do have symptoms that they can confuse, especially in older adults with other things. So very often women will come in with low grade urinary tract infections, which happens as we age. We, as we lose the hormones, we're more likely to get urinary tract infections or even vaginitis, vaginal infections, and they're not sexually transmitted. But there's this assumption sometimes, oh, it's just a UTI. I don't need to check for chlamydia or gonorrhea or trichomonas. When in fact, if they're sexually active, you might need to check for those things. Um, so without taking a good sexual history and understanding what someone's at risk for, um, we'll miss a lot of these infections. There's a whole chapter in the book around things that aren't sexually transmitted infections. There's a lot that happens to our genitals with age that are totally normal. They're, they're aging. Sometimes they're, they're disease states, but they're not sexually transmitted disease states. So it could be a cancer or it could be something as simple as just the atrophy, the thinning of the skin because of the hormone changes. Um, so it's really important that people get to their doctor, especially when they notice a symptom, but even more importantly, you should get to your doctor for regular screening when you don't have symptoms. Yeah. Um, what I liked in the book in particular was you gave antidote, you know, anecdotes for each chapter with how, what was sort of going on, which made it very easy to understand and relatable. And but also it actually shocked you know, some of the things that really shocked me around the cancer, for example, or people passing 
things, sexual toys around of how it happened and you and, and then what happened. And it, I mean, it was good to shock because it made, it made me really think about it. Yes. And they're all real stories, real people, you know, that I've cared for and um, in clinic and the fact is there's this whole continuum around sexuality some people are asexual they don't want to engage in intimacy um, or sexual intimacy but they have other ways they're gratified then you have people that want to have all sorts of different partners and different genders and and they're not they're really interested in doing all sorts of different things and that continuum across the spectrum of humans um, is really important to acknowledge and and say you know no matter where you are in this continuum are you taking care of yourself the best way possible? And knowing that by taking care of yourself, you're taking care of the other people that you're intimate with. And so many of these infections, people don't know they have, and so they continue to share them with each other. Another a big trend that a lot of our older adults are surprised to hear is that you can get these infections in other parts. And so what we call extra genital infections. Um, so you can get chlamydia or gonorrhea in the throat from oral sex. A lot of people will say, well, we're not having sex, but they're having oral sex. And so they're not considering it sex. We're seeing uh, really significant increases, particularly in the younger demographic on anal sex. Um, that has a lot of risk for infections. So if those areas are exposed, they have to be tested and screened as well. And that's a really important thing. You can get infections in your eyes. Now, I always tell everybody, they get very upset about this. This is not from eye sex. It is from people who have a genital infection. They go to the bathroom, they don't wash their hands, they rub their eye. And then the next thing you know, they have chlamydia or gonorrhea or syphilis in their eye. So there are these infections that can show up in other body parts as well. Yes, and I found that quite, having, having never been educated, as I said, I'm from a generation where you weren't really educated on those things. It was a real, I was gonna say, a real eye opener on everything like that and I, I just think it it's what the book made me realize how important it was to understand and I suppose because things have changed you know like you were sort of saying is that it's okay now to start thinking and from 60 onwards we start thinking well we've, we're, we're in another phase of our life it doesn't mean it's the end phase it just means we're on a different phase and actually you, I think as you get older, you start realizing how precious life is. You don't have loads and loads of time, so you've just got to get on with it. I think that's absolutely right. And this this continuum of how people find joy in relationship, it, it's uh, really different. There are some people that don't want to be sexually intimate anymore, and that's totally okay. There are other people that are like, heck yeah, I'm not working anymore. I've got time on my hands. I've got money. Like I can go do travel the world. And they're hooking up with partners in other countries because of the oh. ability to do that. One of the big patterns and changes we've seen is around technology and um, hookup apps or dating apps. Oh. And these things are can be wonderful, but they can also be problematic. So we definitely see in the younger demographic a sort of addictive behavior towards them. But we can actually see that in the older adults as well, where people will become so emotionally dependent on whether someone's swiping on them, that if they're interested in hooking up with them or going on a date with them, or if, if no one is and how hard that is for their self-esteem and they can get very depressed about it. So we, we have to be really mindful as we engage in technology to take the good with the bad and to acknowledge it. If, if someone, if you see yourself where you're on your cell phone constantly and you can't put it away, you're kind of, maybe you're on a dating app and you find yourself every time you look at it getting depressed and feeling bad about yourself and having a lot of negative self-talk it's time to put that away that's not a healthy technology tool for you oh. um or if you're using these hookup apps and you're having lots of unprotected sex with lots of strangers probably not healthy as well <laughs> so you know so on the other hand they can be great one of my i talk about a family friend who was uh, recently widowed and getting into the dating space for the first time in over 50 years and his how challenging it was and but he really just wanted someone to have dinner with or to watch the sunset with and he was just lonely but he was able to find people like that using these dating apps so there's a lot of good that comes with them um, yeah. but there's also some independent risk factors of especially if you're having anonymous sex with sort of random partners and you're not using protection your risk of getting an infection is much much higher 
And I, I think also, if, particularly if you're you're back into the dating thing, you haven't done it for years, you don't know what the etiquette is or the norm. So should you be having sex straight away? Should you be testing? I mean, what would you advise somebody? They've met somebody they like. I mean, presumably you'd say don't ever feel pressurised to do something that you don't want to. Nothing's changed in all the years that we know you used to do what you feel comfortable But, you know, should they, should you ask people what their sexual history is? Should you ask them if they've been checked? What What would you say? I definitely recommend that for everybody. If you're getting ready to enter into a new intimate relationship, you owe it to yourself to know if the person that you're going to be with has been checked recently, because you know how sad if you get to 65, 75 years of age and suddenly get infected with HIV or you have your first herpes outbreak, like that's a bummer. Um, so have that conversation and say, Hey, you know, have you had any other partners in the last few years? If the answer is no, probably low risk. If the answer is yes, well, have you been checked since your last partner? And, and if, you know, what were you checked for? If we should feel comfortable having these conversations, people don't, they struggle with it. My mom read the book um, before I was done with it. She was giving me some advice on it. She says, Shannon, how, and she's widowed now. And, you know, thinking yeah. about me, how in the world do you have that conversation? Yeah. So I put some conversation starters in the book, the ways you could think about it. And I tell everybody practice, get in front of your mirror and just practice saying the words out loud, not in your oh, head. You I like that bit. Talk to the dog. That made me laugh. <laughs> <laughs> and then get one of your best friends be like okay I'm going to pretend like you're this person and now I have to say these words to you and you can do the same thing about going to your doctor people are really apprehensive about even asking their doctor to test them for things so practice saying the words out loud start with your mirror go to your dog then get your best friend involved and then by the time you have that actual real conversation you're not blushing you don't feel weird about it um, and it's it's just better for everybody and I think also to be heartened by the fact that younger people don't have a problem asking that because they've been brought up, as I said earlier, to have those conversations. Yes, they're much more likely to insist on condom use. Or um, we see in the older demographic, the AARP did a study of older adults using condoms, and they are terrible about using condoms with new partners because, one, I think people are afraid to ask somebody to use them, you know, to say those words out loud. And two, nobody's worried about getting pregnant. And so when people think about condoms and what they're for, they're really thinking about it from a pregnancy prevention standpoint. But in fact, it's a barrier that can prevent a lot of the infections from happening. Um, but the older demographic is much less likely to insist on um, getting a good sexual history, finding out about testing, insisting on barrier use, especially with an early intimacy until everybody's been tested and you feel comfortable about things. Um, yeah, the younger the younger population is way more open and comfortable with their sexuality generally, um, I think, than the older population. But we can get there. We just got to get people to start practicing and talking about it. Um, maybe it would help with the conversation. A, the easiest thing I, I would have thought would be to say, please, could we use a condom to start with? You know, that's an easy easier thing to, to say. Or to start the conversation as well. I've been tested recently and I just want you to know that I'm fine. So you're putting the onus on yourself. So somebody then would have to say whether they had been to the doctor. Absolutely. Yeah. Or just or just say, you know, like, what's what's your dating life been like? Do you um, have any partners? You know, I haven't maybe if you haven't been intimate, like, gosh, I haven't had a partner. I'm really nervous about that. I'm really actually afraid about getting an infection you know, open the door for them to say, oh, I just got tested. Everything's okay. I have a little uh, saying I use when I talk to teenagers and do STD talks for teenagers. And I hand out these little keychain flashlights that say on it, looky before nooky, um, which the idea is use this flashlight and scrutinize the genitalia. Because if you're comfortable enough to have sex with somebody, you should be comfortable enough to check them out. Well, of course they are horrified and there's no world where they're going to do that. But it's the, this idea of, you know, really, if you're that comfortable that you're going to be intimate with somebody, you should be able to have a conversation. And and if you can't, then maybe it's too soon. Maybe you shouldn't, you know, advance the relationship yet. I mean, one of the things that you talk about is best sexual practices. I and first of all, I actually read that as the best sexual positions. That's what I first of all thought it actually said. <laughs> and then you went on to say sort of including guidance on medication. 
are there things is there is there something that one would take to be preventative or is it more afterwards okay so prevention has is a really interesting topic and unfortunately prevention leaves the older population out in some places we do have a vaccine now for HPV, human papillomavirus. That's what causes our cervical cancers, um, head and neck cancers, penis cancers, um, interrectal cancers is caused by this virus. And so our younger demographic can be vaccinated for it, but it's not indicated for the older population. Um, there are medicines you can take. So if you're someone who's having a lot of high risk sex, so if you're a man who's having um, sex with other men and you're not using protection, there's a medicine you could take to prevent HIV. Women might take it too. If a woman's having sex with men who are also having sex with men or, or trading sex for drugs or you know engaging in what we would consider high-risk sex, there's a pill you can take every day that can prevent you from getting HIV infection. There's a whole new realm of what we're calling uh, pre-exposure and post-exposure prophylaxis using antibiotics to prevent syphilis infection. Um, or gonorrhea infection, it's really in the early stages. And so we don't have great guidance yet, except for in that really high risk population that we know they're gonna be coming in and getting infections. But generally speaking, there's not much to do after you've had sex, unless you've had a, a traumatic sexual encounter where you've been raped or assaulted, where your risk of infection is much, much higher. Oftentimes the doctor might prescribe treatment just preventatively in that situation, um, but but not routinely per se. And I think, you know, you, you hear about things like syphilis, and I was just reading in the in the book about syphilis, and I was thinking, God, that sounds horrendous. Syphilis to me sounds like one of those old things that they used to have in the old days. You know, we don't have it now, but clearly still around. Oh, it is back. It's been back for about 10 years. It, it had gone away. You're absolutely right. If you look at the data between like 1990 and 2010, it was almost gone. I mean, there were little pockets of it here and there, but we've done a really nice job, especially congenital syphilis, which is when a baby's born with syphilis. And I think part of it's the hookup app culture and, and the more people having more sex with different people in different locations, the world's gotten really small all of a sudden. Um, and our sexual networks have gotten super complicated. And so we're seeing a huge resurgence of syphilis infections. And a lot of the people I'm seeing are 60 plus coming in with syphilis. Um, very common. And it's sneaky. A lot of the times you don't know the early infection. You don't sense it. The secondary infection, you might just get a rash or you might just notice that your hair is falling out in a weird way. You have patches of hair loss. It can show up in all sorts of really vague ways and then you get misdiagnosed that your rash is something else or they put you on some you know allergy medicine or a steroid cream or and people will go months without it being diagnosed and then it could advance and you know infect the heart or the brain and become a really serious infection that's that that i was actually interested you said about being misdiagnosed because i was just thinking will the doctors pick it up or you know are do they not? I mean, I don't know. Do doctors think about it, or are they sort of prey to the fact? Well, you're you're you know you're a bit older. You're pro probably not sexually active, so it's something else. So, does it mean the onus is back to us as a patient to potentially ask the doctor or to tell the doctor I am sexually active with new partners? Yes, if you're not telling your doctor about your sexual risk factors because of bias, implicit bias. There's just this natural bend towards assuming older adults are asexual and they're not having sex or that they're married and monogamous. And there are plenty of polyamorous married adults who are out there having other partners um, consensually, you know, that that's yeah. their, their preferences. And oftentimes they're not yeah. telling doctors. Now, sometimes if you're in a small community, maybe you sing in the choir with your doctor and it feels really weird to talk to them about that. It, one, it shouldn't, you know, the, the democratic oath and confidentiality should not be an issue. But if it is, then, you know, travel to a different clinic and, and get have those conversations and get yourself tested and treated. If your doctor's not asking, shame on them. You need to make them ask and you need to explain what, what your risk factors are and what kind of testing you need. They yeah. should be doing it, but I know that we fall short in healthcare. I think also things have changed a lot. You know, certainly in the UK, we you know, generally now just get to see any doctor that's going, you know, we don't know who we're going to see. You don't have that one-to-one -one relationship as we all used to in a clinic. You just see what doctor is free. 
Um, and I think also because they don't have the time, the onus very much is try to know as much yourself or to suggest things. That's that's the piece I think about the book that I hope I hope people will read it so that they can get their sex ed. Like this is really just sex education for adults. And it's really, we say for 60 plus, but honestly, there are plenty of 30 and 40 year olds uh, that could benefit from Honestly, many- I think I everyone should read it. <laughs> really too. Just sex ed. And so if, even if you think, well, I don't need this. I'm not sexually active or I've been with my partner forever and I'm not changing partners. You've got a friend almost certainly who is maybe taking some risks or having some dating or considering dating you know, arm yourself with the knowledge so you can help your friends out. I think uh-huh. it's that's a really important thing. And so many people are just not, they're just not up to date. I, I rarely see somebody in that 50 plus demographic that when I tell them they have an infection that they don't go, what's that? Because they just haven't heard of a lot of these infections. So if you haven't heard of trichomonas or mycoplasma genitalium, or if you don't know that there are several kinds of hepatitis you can get from sex, like read the book, get caught up on on what you need to know. And particularly as we see more and more cancers in the 50 plus population, head and neck cancers that are coming from HPV virus that people got decades ago and the cancer is now showing up. It's really important for people to understand that because they get very upset when they get a diagnosis that, oh no, my partner must be cheating on me. And no, that's not, it's from an old infection. You know, that's been dormant in your body for decades. So there's just so much to learn that for folks to kind of get caught up but I think it's also just being aware that there is a conversation there to be had because it's just not on an elder you know the older you get it's just not on the people's horizon to talk about it it's it's thinking oh my god it's really exciting I'm gonna have a new boyfriend or whatever you might say but the sex bit yes you'll think that you're going to have sex but the thought about sexual past is just I just don't think it's there we don't we don't think about it yeah, or just feel too uncomfortable to talk about it. And yeah. so I, you know, we've got to we've got to get people more comfortable. And, and part of the approach to that is let's not make it so serious. Let's have a little fun. So like in the book, I have limericks I've written about different infections. Yeah. I've got my rap videos. It's like, let's have some fun, you know, thinking about this. I just went, I did my first country cover where instead of grandma getting run over by a reindeer, some of y'all might know that song in the UK. I don't know. It's big in the US. <laughs> Um, grandma gets infected with a virus. You know, she's on a dating app. She swipes right on Christmas Eve, hooks up with Fred, they have sex. And by New Year, she has herpes. It's, a, it's like, yes, these are serious things, but let's have fun thinking about them, learning about them, and then getting comfortable talking about them. Yeah, I just think, and, you know, it's that nipping it in the bud before, you know, I think you say, if you leave things too late, it is too late and you do untold damage. Yes, absolutely. Some of these infections, particularly when we think about younger women, a lot of these infections, chlamydia is very common in younger women, and it causes chronic pelvic pain, infertility. They will never be able to have a baby because of an infection they didn't even know they had because they didn't get it tested and treated. Um, And that's tragic. So another piece of this is when I do talks for older adults is, okay, so maybe you're not going to be sexually active right now, but I guarantee you, you've probably got, if you've got kids or grandkids, they are sexually active. And so understanding what's out there so that you can have frank conversations with, with your grandkids. Hey, grandkid, have you gotten the HPV vaccine? You know, have you protected yourself from this cancer? Are you using condoms? Are you making good choices? Like, why not have those conversations? Absolutely. And with more people, well, I mean, obviously Viagra has been around to allow that to carry on. But for women, the fact, you know, HRT is far more easy, accessible. It makes women far more ready and willing and, you know, able with lots of things. It's true. Better living through pharmaceuticals. So um, the guys have had the erectile dysfunction drugs for a while. They're now really cheap. I remember when it used to be $10 a pill and, and the guys would have to decide, you know, well, you know, is it worth that? You know, like, <laughs> <She's> worth it. <laughs> it would, um, say it was worth it. Uh, but now we do have better uh, hormone treatments, even topical for women that have risk for blood clots or cancer or hypertension, where they can't take the oral hormone um, or injectable or patches. They might be able to use a topical, which makes sex a lot more comfortable for them. Um, uh, and, and then there are some women who can't. And there's because they've had a breast cancer history and, and they really don't want to be on any hormones at all. 
Um, there are other topical treatments that we can use now. We're getting better at it. That's another, I think, really important piece is talking to your doctor about not just are you sexually active or you're, are you at risk, but are you are you pleasantly sexually active or does it hurt? Or are you having discharge or discomfort? There are things we can do to help. So if, if you're sexually active and it's not pleasant, but you're doing it because you know your partner wants it, um, you know, talk about it with your doctor. There might be things we can do to help. Uh, but so many people are embarrassed and they don't want to talk about it. Yes, and I think we've found that with a lot of the research that we've done at Talk Health, it's how important it is, A, to keep talking to your partner or bring the subject up. So it's not the fact that you've gone off, off your partner that you don't want to have sex. You suddenly find sex is very painful. And if yeah. you haven't explained to your partner what it is, because you're probably going through the menopause, which is what's triggered it off, um, how on earth is the, is, you know, is the partner supposed to know why you don't suddenly don't want sex unless you tell them? Absolutely. Or, or you've got an inflammatory condition or you have psoriasis, you know, a skin, a common skin condition. There are a lot of reasons why men and women will develop concerns with their genitalia and then we'll often just hide it or avoid sex rather than treating it. And then by the time they come to the doctor, it's really bad. And so it's a lot harder for us to help get it better than when people I think this is a really key piece and men are better at this than women, but being comfortable with your body and knowing your body so that if something is different, you know, so that you can go to your doctor. A lot of uh, women have a lot of shame around their genitals. There's uh, just a long history of of shame attached to sexuality and women's genitals. So whereas men are much more comfortable looking at and touching their genitals, um, we find that women are less so. So I encourage uh, women to be familiar with their bodies so that if something looks different or feels different, they can go to the doctor and say, hey, can you take a look at this? I have a new mole or I'm something's funny and I, or something's just not right and I know it. Um, that's really important. So I think for me, the, the big takeaways are Talk to your partner straight away so you feel comfortable about understanding their background. And then mention to the doctor, if something's not right, go to the doctor as soon as possible and, and just say it as it is. Yes. And I have so many people that have been suffering for weeks um, or months with painful you know, discharges. And, and it's like, gosh, if you had just come in, I could have made you better like right away with one dose of antibiotic. Like you didn't have to, to sit and suffer at home. Um, but also, even if you don't have symptoms and you need to get screened. So you, it's really important that if you're having new partners, new intimate relationships, um, yeah. you need to get it checked. Yeah, absolutely. So on that note, I feel like we're really plugging the book and that wasn't necessarily the, the conversation, but it's, it is so easy to read and to understand so much, you know, and I even like the bit where you say, well, is it an STD or an STI? Yeah, right. We all, we, this, it, the rules are constantly changing on us. And so yeah. we're supposed to be saying STI now, because apparently a disease is more stigmatizing than an infection. Um, but, it, you know, the truth of the matter is when somebody comes in with a genital infection, I don't care whether it's a D or an I, they're not happy. <laughs> so it's, yes. Yeah. All that though. Yes. I go into all the sort of current debates and issues and I do a little history for those of you that are history buffs out there. I talk about the history of syphilis, which is really actually very interesting. Um, and it's kind of some horrific treatments back in the day of how they would treat. It makes you realize how far we've come in medicine. Yeah, Absolutely. Well, Shannon, thank you so much for your time because I know that you are super busy. Please read, um, you know, Shannon has done a Talk Health um, Meets article for us, uh, as uh, all our experts do. But Shannon's is very interesting and it is amusing because in there we have put her rap videos or links to it. So please do go and have a look at them. And uh, thank you, Shannon, once again. And thank you, everyone, for joining us. Thanks so much. Thank you. Bye.